This is Space Time, Series 22, Episode 45. Coming up on Space Time. A giant mass anomaly detected under the Moon's largest crater. Discovery of the UK's biggest ever meteor impact site. And the asteroid with a 1 in 7,000 chance of hitting the Earth this September. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A mysterious large mass of material has been discovered deep beneath the solar system's largest impact crater, the moon's south pole, Atkin Basin. The findings, reported in the journal Geophysical Research Letters, suggest the structure may contain metals from the asteroid which formed the crater. The study's lead author, Assistant Professor Peter James from Baylor University, says the structure is some five times larger than the Big Island of Hawaii. The Atkin Basin is several kilometres deep and some 2,000 kilometres wide, roughly the distance between Sydney, Australia and Auckland, New Zealand, or New York City to Lincoln, Nebraska. Despite its size, the basin can't be seen from Earth because it's on the far side of the Moon, the side which never faces the Earth. Scientists detected the anomaly by measuring subtle changes in the strength of gravity around the Moon using NASA's Gravity Recovery and Interior Laboratory spacecraft GRAIL. When combined with lunar topography data from NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, scientists determined there was an unexpectedly large amount of mass hundreds of kilometres beneath the South Pole Atkin Basin. One of the possible explanations for this extra mass is that it's metal from the asteroid's core which formed the crater in the first place, that metal still embedded in the Moon's mantle. James says that this dense mass, whatever it is and wherever it came from, is weighing the basin floor down by more than a kilometre. Computer simulations of large asteroid impacts on the lunar surface suggest that under the right conditions, the iron-nickel core of a metallic asteroid may be dispersed into the upper mantle during impact. The authors calculated that a sufficiently dispersed asteroid impact core could well remain suspended in the Moon's mantle until the present day, rather than sinking down to the Moon's core. Of course, it's not the only possibility. It's also possible that the large mass may be a concentration of dense oxides associated with the final stages of lunar magma ocean solidification. James says that the South Pole Atkin Basin, thought to have been created about 4 billion years ago, is the largest preserved crater in the solar system. While larger impacts have occurred throughout the solar system's history, including on Earth, most traces of these have been lost. I'm Stuart Gary. You're listening to Space Time. Scientists have finally pinpointed the impact site of a giant kilometre-wide asteroid which slammed into what is now northwestern Scotland 1.2 billion years ago. Evidence for the giant ancient impact was discovered back in 2008, but the exact location of Ground Zero has remained a mystery, at least until now. A report in the Journal of the Geological Society pinpointed the crater some 15 to 20 kilometres west of a remote part of the Scottish coastline around Loch Broom. The study's lead author, Dr. Ken Armel from Oxford University, says the thickness and extent of the debris deposit suggests the impact crater was close to the coast, but its precise location had remained a mystery. Using a combination of field observations, the distribution of broken rock fragments known as basement clasts, and the alignment of magnetic particles allowed the authors to determine the direction the meteorite material took from several locations, thereby plotting the likely location of the crater. The new data shows it's buried beneath water and younger rocks in the Minch Basin. Amor says it's an exciting discovery. That's because material excavated during a giant meteorite impact is rarely preserved on Earth, due to it being rapidly obliterated by erosion, burial and plate tectonics. He says it was purely by chance that this one landed in an ancient rift valley, where fresh sediment quickly covered the debris, preserving it. Amor says it must have been quite a spectacle when the giant meteorite struck the barren landscape, spreading dust and rocky debris over a wide area. Mind you, when all this occurred 1.2 billion years ago, most life on Earth was still in the oceans, and there were no plants on land. At that time, what is now Scotland would have been very close to the equator and in a semi-arid environment. 
The landscape would have looked a bit like Mars when it had water on its surface. The geological evidence shows that Earth and other planets all suffered high rates of meteorite impacts in the distant past as they collided with debris left over from the formation of the early solar system. However, Armour points out that doesn't rule out the possibility of similar events happening in the future, especially given the number of asteroids and comet fragments still floating around in the solar system. Small impacts, where meteorites are a few metres across, are thought to be relatively common, occurring perhaps once every 25 years or so on average. It's thought collisions with objects like this one, which was an estimated kilometre in size, probably occur about once every 100,000 years to once every million years. But estimates vary. The authors say their next step will be to undertake a detailed geological survey of the target area. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Okay, let's stick with the asteroid impact theme we've developed in today's show. And time now for a little bit of doomsday clickbait. Dangling at the end of our hook is asteroid 2006 QV89, a 30-metre-wide chunk of space rock which has a 1 in 7,299 chance of hitting the Earth on September the 9th this year. Now, before everyone gets too excited, it will most likely miss the planet, but astronomers can't be 100% sure because its orbit isn't precisely known. The asteroid was first detected by the Catalina Sky Survey on August 29, 2006, but only a short observational run was possible at the time. Still, based on that, trajectory data predictions by the European Space Agency suggest it will most likely miss the Earth by at least 6.7 million kilometres, a comfortable margin, especially when you consider that by comparison, the Moon orbits the Earth at an average distance of 384,400 kilometres. The other important thing to remember about QV89 is that it's small, just 30 metres across. The KT Boundary Event asteroid, which wiped out 75% of all life on Earth, including the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago, was at least 10 kilometres across. 2006 QV89 is part of the Apollo group of near-Earth asteroids, and is thought to likely be a frequent visitor to near-Earth space, with follow-up visits expected in 2032, 2045 and 2062. In fact, out of the 10 most likely asteroids to slam into the Earth, this one's only ranked fourth. Mind you, things will be getting a little bit more interesting in the future. In less than a decade from now, on April 13th, 2029, astronomers will be gearing up for what will be a far closer near miss by what will be a far larger asteroid. That's when 99942 Apophis will pass just 31,200 kilometres above the Earth's surface, give or take 700 kilometres. That's closer than many satellites orbiting the planet. Now, it won't hit the Earth during that encounter, but it will be coming awfully close. Compared to QV89, Apophis is a monster, some 370 kilometres wide. And depending on how it interacts gravitationally with the Earth during its 2029 close encounter, future encounters were thought to get even more interesting, with a possible collision with the Earth exactly seven years later, on April 13th, 2036. But there's some good news on that front, with new calculations and observations now suggesting the 2036 encounter will take place earlier in March and at a safer distance of over 8.4 million kilometres. A comfortable margin. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. Scientists think that most diamonds found on Earth are made from carbon recycled from the seabed and then cooked up deep inside the planet's mantle. But now scientists have for the first time recreated the salts often found trapped inside these diamonds, a key step to confirming the process. The study, published in Science Advances, settles a long-standing question about the formation of diamonds. Diamonds are crystals of carbon that form deep beneath the Earth's crust in very old parts of the mantle. They're brought to the Earth's surface through volcanic eruptions in a very special kind of magma called kimberlite. While gem diamonds are usually made of pure carbon, so-called fibrous diamonds, which are cloudy and less appealing to jewelers, often include small traces of potassium, sodium and other minerals that reveal information about the environments in which they were formed. These fibrous diamonds are commonly ground down and used in technical applications like drill bits. 
The study's lead author, Dr. Michael Forster from Macquarie University, says there's long been a theory that salts trapped inside diamonds came from marine seawater. And this research has now demonstrated that the processes that lead to diamond growth is indeed driven by the recycling of oceanic sediments in subduction zones. He says that while some diamonds are created by a different process involving the crystallization of melts deep in the Earth's mantle, most diamonds found on Earth's surface are formed through the oceanic sediment process. The other thing about fibrous diamonds is they grow more quickly than gem diamonds, which allows them to trap tiny samples of the fluids around them as they form. Forster and colleagues knew that some sort of salty fluid must be around while these diamonds are growing. For this process to occur, a large slab of seafloor would need to slide down to a depth of more than 200 kilometers below the surface quite quickly. This is a process known as subduction, in which one tectonic plate slides underneath another. The rapid descents required, because the sediment needs to be compressed to more than 4 gigapascals, that's 40,000 times atmospheric pressure on the surface, before it begins to melt at the temperatures of more than 800 degrees Celsius found in the ancient mantle. In order to test their idea, the authors carried out a series of high-pressure, high-temperature experiments. They placed marine sediment samples in a vessel with a rock called peridotite, which is the most common type of rock found in the part of the mantle where diamonds form. They then turned up the pressure and heat, giving the samples time to react with one another in conditions like those found at different parts of the mantle. The authors found at pressures between 4 and 6 gigapascals and at temperatures between 800 and 1100 degrees Celsius, corresponding to depths of between 120 and 180 kilometers below the surface, salts were formed with a balance of sodium and potassium that closely matches the small traces found in diamonds. Forster says this demonstrates that the processes that lead to diamond growth are indeed driven by the recycling of oceanic sediments in subduction zones. He says the experiments also resulted in the formation of minerals which are the necessary ingredients for the formation of kimberlite magmas which then transport the diamonds up to the surface. In general, so diamond is made of pure carbon. Of course, it can have some impurities, but the crystal diamond um, is composed of carbon and carbon is a very common element within yeah, the universe and on Earth. Um, and carbon in, inside diamonds and can come from superficial carbon from the Earth's surface that could be from organic material that degrades and forms um, graphite. Or it could be from carbonates like limestone, carbonate producing animals. And it can also come from mantle carbon because the mantle inside Earth, it also has carbonates. And in order to produce diamond, we need to have a certain pressure and that would be at a depth of about 150 kilometers beneath us. The, the pressure is high enough so the carbon can get diamond. So it, it's the stable crystal form at that depth. How does the carbon usually get down to those depths? So when we think about plate tectonics, so we have the plates that move on the Earth's surface and some of these plates, they um, slip beneath another plate, and when they slip beneath, its process is called subduction. The plate um, dives and sinks into the mantle, and on its way downwards, it carries the carbon with it. And this carbon, at some stage, is at a depth high enough to transform to diamond. And getting back up to the surface, this is where the kimberlite ducts come in, isn't it? Yeah, this is the process that's, of course, rare. So kimberlite are these kind of um, magmas, or in the surface, called lavas that transport um, diamonds to the surface because they are rooted at the depths where the diamonds are formed. Most other magmas come from shallower depths and don't have diamonds within them. But kimberlites, yeah, they carry the diamonds rapidly to the surface. And uh, you've been looking at some specific features in diamonds. We know that boron can make some diamonds look blue. Uh, and there are other chemicals which will make diamonds, rather than being clear, crystal clear, dare I say, will make diamonds look pink or yellow or, or even reddish or brown. And you've been looking at a different type of inclusion, Salts. Tell me about that. Yeah, so it's already known that a lot of diamonds, I think most of them, they have these um, little bubbles, inclusions of saline fluid. And this that is it's interesting that it, the salt is not the normal sodium chloride, so it could be also sodium chloride in some cases, but mostly it's a potassium chloride in which some, most of the saline um, inclusions are um, potassium rich salt. And then, of course, then excuse me, where does this salt come from? And in my studies, and these were part of my PhD, um, we did experiments along the subduction pathway. So we wanted to look what happens with stuff that comes from the surface and gets into the mantle, what happens along the journey. And the salt within the diamonds is just one stage of um, that 
resulted to this publication. That's what the experiment was really about, looking at how the salt would have got there. Yeah, we wanted to know how do we get this potassium enrichment in the salt, because that was hard to explain, because they already thought, yeah, the, the salt that comes from the seawater, because the plates that go down are mostly oceanic plates, and in the ocean you have a lot of um, water, a lot of salty water, but then the salt has some how to get rid of the sodium, but increase in potassium to get the composition that you see within the diamond. And that was the crucial part of the experiments to simulate what is happening there. And so tell me about the experiment itself. So in the experiments, we simulated this layered, as a layered experiment. So we had the sediment on, in the lower layer in this um, experimental container and a piece of mantle in the upper part. So this whole container is a platinum capsule about four millimeters long and also in diameter. It's not very big, but it can only be that small because because in order to simulate the high pressures inside Earth, we have to put it into a high pressure apparatus here on the surface of Earth. And this apparatus, it's like a big metal block with a cylinder in the middle that compresses the small capsule. And normally you use these cylinders to lift heavy trucks, but in, we um, use this cylinder to compress a tiny little capsule. And then within the capsule, you have the pressure that is um, similar to inside Earth. Then we heat it up. Yeah, and what sort of yes. pressures and temperatures do you reach as you increase the pressure and temperature in this sort of Thing. Yeah, so the apparatus is even capable to go to even greater pressures that are similar to about 200 kilometers beneath the surface. And temperatures, you can heat them uh, much higher than actually it is inside Earth. So you can heat them up to 1,800 degrees. But when we think about diamond formation we, and the colder subduction region, our experiments, they took place between 800 and 1,100 degrees Celsius. Between four and six gigapascals. Yeah, that translates to 120 and 180 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface. And what did you find? Yeah, so the interesting thing is that, of course, both, both layers, they immediately starting to react with each other. And this reaction zone that forms between both layers, you can divide it into two different ones. So at a shallow depth where there's no diamond formation, we didn't find any salts. We just had what we would expect. We, we get mica, shiny flaky mineral, and that takes some of the chlorine and the potassium and sodium. But at higher pressures, we didn't get the micas anymore. In fact, we got the salts within the reaction zone. And that was quite a finding because the salts, they had the same potassium to sodium ratios like the rock layer with the micas had at, at shallower depth. So that was quite interesting to see. How does that relate to diamonds? And within this um, reaction zone, we also had the precursor phases of diamonds. So we had graphite um, that is, uh, of course, at a pressure meter stable, but in this pressure range, it would take much longer than our experimental procedure um, of two to four days to produce diamond, but we know that uh, that pressure is already known that you would have diamond. So we have all the ingredients. We have the diamond in the same layer with the salt. And in a natural environment, we have much longer time. Of course, the diamonds that grow simultaneously with the saline inclusions, they would um, encapsulate them within them. How does this expand our knowledge on how diamonds are formed geologically in Earth? Yeah, it's another independent study that shows that most of the diamond material comes from the surface and only some of the diamonds are made from mantle carbonates and from stuff that's with inside Earth all the time. And we see that the process of subduction is the main driver of diamond formation. So the recycling of superficial material inside Earth produces most of the diamonds. And it's also interesting that we also got the precursor phases, not only for the diamonds, but also for the magnets that, produ uh, that transport the diamonds to the surface, these kimberlites. These kimberlite magnets, yeah. Carbon rich magmas, and we got besides the um, salts and the carbon, we also got a um, magnesite, which is an important um, carbonate that is, has to be within the source of these kimberlites. So we got a whole bunch of ingredients that um, led to diamonds and kimberlite magmatism that transports them to the surface. That's Dr. Michael Forster from Macquarie University. And this is Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. A SpaceX Dragon cargo ship has splashed down safely an hour after firing its thrusters to begin its deorbit burn. The crew aboard the International Space Station had used the orbiting outpost robotic arm to detach the Dragon CRS-17 capsule from the station's Harmony module five and a half hours earlier. Station Robo, release commanded. I see tension decreasing. Station Robo, snares open. Begin monitoring for drift out. We see the arm moving. Station Robo, back off in progress. Robo, station on two. One and a half meters clear. Robo copies. Robo, station 
four and a half meters clear. Houston on two, Dragon depart, commanded. Houston copies. The first burn is complete. It was a six second burn. The second of the three burns is underway. Then on two, C, burn in progress, completed. And David, we concur. Departure burn two is complete. Departure burn three will be in approximately seven minutes. Continue monitoring for step six of 1.602. And the third in the series of three burns is underway. David, departure burn three is complete. Dragon is outside the keep out sphere. Copy that. It's a beautiful sight. Farewell, Dragon. The spacecraft, loaded with some 1,029 kilograms of returned scientific experiments and equipment, splashed down safely in the North Pacific Ocean, 320 kilometers southwest of Long Beach, California. The Dragon had launched aboard a Falcon 9 rocket from Space Launch Complex 40 at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida back on May the 4th, carrying some 2,495 kilograms of supplies and equipment, arriving on station two days later. A Russian Soyuz STB rocket has blasted off from the European Space Agency's Kourou spaceport in French Guiana, carrying the final four satellites of the O3B constellation. We are off. The next four satellites in the O3B constellation have started their journey. From the pad here in the Amazon rainforest, everything is going according to plan. Those four boosters are doing all the work right now. They're hauling us away from the gravity of our planet. They burn for a couple of minutes, but that's enough to get us away from the pull of Earth. La propulsion est nominal. And their propulsion is normal. Nominal means normal. 37 kilometers above the Earth right now and climbing. This is the scheduled moment for the boosters to be jettisoned. Separation des boosters. And that's been confirmed. We have separated our boosters. And I can hear the sound of the Soyuz here now over the mission control center, which is about 20 kilometers from the pad. It takes a while for the sound to get to us. We're traveling at 2.19 kilometers per second. The lanceur is stable. He's telling us the launch vehicle is stable. We are now 120 kilometers above Earth. Until now, we've been flying through the dense part of the atmosphere. We no longer have friction because we are in space. So we can jettison our fairing. Separation de la coiffe. And that's now being confirmed. We have jettisoned the fairing. The four O3B satellites at the front attached to their special Dispenser. The mission was the fifth for telecommunications company SES under its current contract to place 20 of the 700 kilogram broadband satellites into an 8,000 kilometer high medium Earth orbit. The flight was also the fourth for Ariane Space this year and the second for 2019 using the Russian Soyuz. <laughs> And time now to take a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with the Science Report. Scientists have agreed to designate a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, to mark the profound ways in which humans have irrevocably changed the planet. A report in the journal Nature claims the decision by the 34-member Anthropocene Working Group is another key step towards the formal recognition of this new phase in Earth's geological record. The new epoch will now be submitted to the International Commission on Stratigraphy, which oversees the official geological time chart. The working group recommended the Anthropocene epoch commenced during the mid-20th century, when geological sediments and glacial ice begin to show the first significant evidence of human intervention, including the detonation of the first atomic bomb and significant increases in pollution from industrial production and the use of agricultural chemicals. We've all been told that eating fermented food and yogurt is good for your gut, and scientists think they've finally worked out why. A report in the journal PLOS has found that humans and great apes have receptors in their immune cells, which detect the byproducts of lactic acid bacteria, the kind commonly found in yogurt and fermented foods. 
When cells sense these byproducts, they trigger immune cells to spring into action, most likely to mediate beneficial and anti-inflammatory effects. It's thought the receptor may have evolved to help the ancestors of humans and apes eat food which was decaying, such as fruit picked up off the ground. Canadian researchers have unmasked a major disinformation campaign with links to the Iranian government, which included posing as mainstream media outlets to spread lies targeting the United States, Israel and Saudi Arabia. The University of Toronto Citizen Lab says the disinformation group aligned to the Islamic Republic impersonated legitimate media outlets using copycat styles to push their fake news propaganda. The Tehran Finance Group, which the researchers have dubbed Endless Mayfly, used fake online identities to then amplify the stories by tweeting about them thousands of times and forwarding links to others. Australia's nuclear research reactor at Lucas Heights in Sydney South is getting a big boost from the New South Wales state government. ANSTO, the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organisation, says the multi-million dollar boost will support the facility's innovations precinct and the expansion of the Nandin Deep Technology Incubator. The innovation precinct is designed to bring together both Australian and international scientists, as well as students, startups and industries. It includes a next-generation nuclear medicine cluster, focusing on the development of diagnostics and therapies for the treatment of cancer and other diseases. The world of mobile communications is undergoing its biggest evolution in years, following the official launch of the 5G network in Australia. The country's biggest telco has started selling 5G-compatible cell phones and hardware. The new 5G technology promises download speeds as much as 1.2 gigabytes per second. That's more than 20 times faster than anything else on the market, and six times faster than the national broadband network. There is, however, one big problem with 5G. It's not available everywhere. At least not yet. But within 12 months, the rollout should see up to 35 cities across Australia hooked up. To find out more, we're joined by Alex Horosh from whistleout.com.au. So 5G um, is the next major evolution in mobile network technology. Kind of with 4G before it, 5G is focused on mobile data and improving mobile data speed. And to do that, they go to higher frequencies, don't they? Yeah, so 5G networks that are being built in Australia right now are being built on what we call sub-6 frequencies. So that's radio frequencies under 6 gigahertz. Right now, it's around 3.5 gigahertz is what's being used by Tolstra and Optus, who have already started building their 5G networks. Going forward in a few years, we'll also be using millimeter wave frequencies that start around 26 gigahertz. And those will be faster, but they'll have a smaller range. Comparing 5 5G to 4G. What are the advantages for well, for you and me as uh, as users of the new technology? Right now, 5G is still in its infancy. Like these networks are still quite new, and the performance is kind of, I guess, comparable to 4G. Maybe a little bit faster depending on where you have coverage. But as the networks mature over the next couple of months, next few years, the idea is that 5G networks will be capable of download speeds as fast as 20 gigabits per second. They'll have lower latency, which is essentially the time it takes information to get from your phone to the wide internet and back again. So 4G networks have a typical latency of around 60 milliseconds, maybe 30 in if you've got good coverage, whereas with a millimeter wave, 5G could be as low as one millisecond, which is going to be great for things like self-driving cars where every millisecond matters. And 5G will also eventually allow more devices to connect to the network at the same time. So this will help reduce congestion, but also will really help with new developments like autonomous cars, connected machinery, and internet, of th- and internet of things devices when we have more and more connected devices connecting to our networks. This is when your refrigerator starts talking to your local grocery store and things like this. Yeah, exactly. And um, without relying on your home internet where it's got its own SIM card, for example. I guess what everyone's going to want to know is products. We know that uh, Samsung have come on quickly in the 5G market. They're not the only ones, but there are a few 5G products out there already, and some we're going to have to wait a year for, like Apple. Uh, Yeah, that's correct. So Telstra has gone in first with... 5G and it's currently the only network provider that's currently selling commercial 5G devices. They've got Samsung Galaxy S10 5G, the Oppo Reno 5G and LG's V50. They, if you want a 5G modem, they've also got the HTC 5G hub, which is a portable hotspot that can support up to 20 devices at once. Optus is also running 5G home broadband trials, where but you need to um, register your interest on Optus's website first, and then we'll get back to you 
you if you're in an area where they have capacity. So it's not something you can just sign up for and get going straight away. The ones who are missing out on the initial burst of 5G, I guess, will be Apple users. That's correct. Apple isn't likely to announce a 5G iPhone until 2020, but that's not entirely surprising. Apple was about a year late to the 4G bandwagon as well. Apple tends to wait until the technology is a bit more mature rather than just rushing out for the sake of being burst. That's Alex Horosh from whistleout.com.au. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from spacetimewithstuartgary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 